Hi guys, Harry here. Welcome to Scrap Science. In a video quite a while ago, uh, what we did was we put together an electrodialysis cell, uh, just a small one, uh, out of PVC. Uh, so we can electrolyze solutions uh, with a membrane uh, between the two electrodes. Maybe the anode would go here and the cathode would go here. And I'm planning on making a series on uh, electrolyzing different um, ionic compounds in this kind of setup to generate various different acids and bases and various other things. So today we're going to do well, the first episode of that kind of thing where we're going to do the standard electrodialysis experiment which is um, building a chloralkali cell and using it to produce some sodium hydroxide. Now I've made a couple of videos already on making sodium hydroxide with this kind of setup with electrodialysis but really in those other videos I've been going into the chemistry mainly uh, as to how it all works whereas in this video what we're going to be doing is trying to optimize the setup conditions in order to generate the um, greatest amount of sodium hydroxide uh, for any given current or any given time or charge that we put through the cell. So what we're going to do with our standardized uh, electrodialysis cell is we're going to run it maybe five times. Um, we're going to try to work out what's the best sodium salt to use. So we'll run it with our regular sodium chloride, sodium carbonate, and then sodium bicarbonate to see which one of those uh, generates the sodium hydroxide um, the fastest. We're going to try running it at different currents, and we're going to try running it with different sodium ion concentrations to see what uh, it is that affects um, the rate of production of sodium hydroxide to the greatest extent. I'm thinking this is the kind of format we'll be doing for the rest of this series, like optimizing it for sodium hydroxide, and then in other videos we'll be optimizing uh, making sulfuric acid, making nitric acid, making potassium hydroxide, all of those other things that can be done with an electrodialysis cell like this. So without further ado, I think we will set everything up and get our first cell running. Uh, we'll use sodium chloride to start off with. To set everything up, we'll start with the cell. Now, if you remember from that video before where we built this, uh, it's our uh, two chambers, one for the anode and one for the cathode. Um, and then we put a small uh, membrane between the two half cells. Uh, what I've got here is not really the best membrane, uh, but it'll do uh, just for our standardized testing for now. I'll do a future video where we actually go over um, some of the different membrane options and compare them and everything. Um, but what I have here is just a piece of a flower pot which is siliconed in uh, this small piece of PVC pipe. And what that'll do is just connect the two half cells together like that. The anode and the cathode are now separated by uh, the semi-permeable membrane uh, from the flower pot. Now the membrane itself doesn't have all that higher surface area to connect the two half cells so we don't expect the uh, available current that we'll be able to draw through the cell uh, to be especially high but again uh, this is just a standardized test if you actually wanted to generate um, sodium hydroxide what you should do is aim for the largest area uh, of the membrane that you can make uh, maybe like use a full flower pot as the membrane itself as I have in other videos and for the electrodes, uh, just again for the standard testing, uh, we're just going to use two graphite rods. One is the cathode and one is the anode, uh, just so we can repeat uh, the experiment. To run the cell, uh, what we need, as I've gone over in various other videos, uh, to generate our sodium hydroxide, what we need is to fill one of the chambers, the anode chamber, with a sodium salt solution. Uh, put in the cathode chamber, distilled water, right? apply current, so we have the cathode and the anode. The negative charge of the cathode will attract the uh, positive charge on the sodium ions, so the sodium ions will traverse through the semi-permeable membrane into the cathode chamber. And in the cathode chamber, on the actual cathode, uh, what is being generated is hydrogen gas, as per normal electrolysis, uh, and a byproduct of hydrogen gas production is hydroxide ions. So as we electrolyze, sodium ions will traverse from the anode to the cathode and mix with the um, hydroxide ions being generated on the cathode, forming a pure 
sodium hydroxide solution in the cathode compartment. Obviously that was a big simplification of the process, but um, if you want to go into more detail you can check out uh, my other videos on the topic. So to start our first control test, uh, what we're going to work with first is a solution of sodium chloride, which I've prepared earlier. Uh, 100 milliliters because each of these half cells uh, is around about 100 milliliters in volume. Uh, this is one molar sodium chloride. Um, what's really important is the concentration of the sodium ion, which luckily for us is exactly the same as the concentration of the sodium chloride in this case. But once we get to sodium carbonate, uh, it is going to be a little bit different. Anyway, as I was saying, for our control test, we will simply fill our anode chamber with our one molar um, sodium chloride solution and then our cathode chamber with distilled water and electrolyze. Now to power our electrolysis cell, uh, you can see what I've set up here is somewhat of a really terrible power supply. It looks really bad at this stage, I mean I've put it together on a piece of styrofoam, um, but uh, basically put 12 volts in, we can control the voltage and current of our output and this thing will measure the number of moles of electrons that we push through the cell. And there we go, I think I've got everything set up correctly. Hopefully uh, everything I've built down here turns on correctly. Uh, let's see, that's looking good. Now you'll notice that we're getting uh, no current at the moment and that's because of course we have distilled water in the cathode side but that electrostatic attraction between the sodium ions and the cathode should drag some sodium ions across into the cathode chamber pretty soon and that current should rise quite quickly. So with this control test that we're running now and same for all the other tests that we'll be doing later, what we're basically going to be doing is running this cell for maybe a bit over 24 hours, run maybe 100 millimoles of electrons through the cell, which if the cell were running at 100% efficiency would be enough to convert all of the sodium chloride into sodium hydroxide. Um, at regular intervals in that time we will remove about 5 milliliters of our catholite solution and uh, store it in a little vial or something. Um, and then at the end of the run we'll be able to maybe titrate all of our samples and be able to maybe plot a graph of the concentration of sodium hydroxide versus uh, time or the amount of charge that we've put through the cell. But anyway we'll let this current build up for the next few minutes and we'll come back when everything's running smoothly. Did I say that the current will rise quickly? Uh, because that was definitely a lie. It has been five hours since we started the cell and uh, we're not seeing any measurable current through the cell but I have been measuring it uh, periodically over the past five hours and the current has actually been building up. Um, this meter doesn't really measure low currents very well. We've got about 40 milliamps of current flowing through the cell right now uh, which is visible if we get you over closer to uh, the electrolysis going on. You can see the cathode is bubbling very well. A bunch of hydrogen coming out there and the anode is also bubbling. You can see all the bubbles of chlorine uh, coming out of the cell there. Anyway, the reason that the current is taking so long to build up is because, of course, we have a very small diaphragm between the electrodes um, and the concentration of the sodium hydroxide in the cathode chamber is going to take quite a while to increase. Uh, but seeing as we've been running the cell for five hours, um, we will take out five milliliters of our catholite solution um, store it in a vial and continue electrolysis. I think I'll set the current limit to around about uh, 0.15 amps. I think that's probably a good current to be putting through the cell. So there we go, that is our first sample uh, from the cathode chamber. Uh, we will titrate that later once we've done the entire run. Again, we'll leave the current to build up over the next few hours, uh, but till then we'll just leave it to do its thing. At the end of the run, here we are. Everything seems to have gone uh, relatively well. Kind of smells like chlorine, which is uh, not normally a good sign, but in this case, uh, it's excellent because we know that the cell is working. The vessel didn't leak at all, which is good. Um, the electrolysis continued um, 
as expected. Um, it says we have set the current limit to 60 milliamps there, but that's really 153 milliamps as per uh, the measurement on my multimeter. So given the fact that we've been measuring current um, periodically for the past more than 24 hours, um, it shouldn't be too hard to work out uh, how much charge we put through the cell, despite the fact that our coolometer seems to not be working. Anyway, we are coming up to the end of our runtime for this control test. So what I'll do is um, take the final sample from the catholite. That'll make five samples total. We will shut down the cell and then tomorrow we will set up the next run with maybe we'll do sodium carbonate next and we will titrate our five samples of this run and graph the results. Actually, I might not bother filming any of the rest of the tests. I uh, just know that we will do, we've done our control run. Uh, we'll do our next run with the sodium carbonate. Uh, we'll do the next run with sodium bicarbonate and then a run after that with sodium chloride again at a higher concentration, uh, maybe two molar instead of one molar. And then a final run maybe uh, at a higher current. So I'll do all four of those remaining tests off camera and then I'll get back to you with the nice graphical results that we generate from that, which will hopefully lead to some conclusions about uh, what's the best setup for an amateur chloralkali cell. Back another week later, and I have finished uh, running all five runs of the cell, and we have titrated uh, every sample from every single one of those runs, so we should be able to graph the results now. Uh, before we do that, uh, just make a couple of comments about the cell. Um, in the final run, which was the one that we ran at a higher current, um, just the last couple of samples that we took out of that, the uh, anode, the carbon anode, did disintegrate. As you can see, the carbon electrode had fallen out of the cell. So those last couple of samples aren't actually um, reliable data for our graphing of the results, so we won't include them. But it's not a big loss. Uh, we did four whole runs of the cell uh, without any problems and the final run uh, ran without problems for more than 24 hours, so um, everything's looking good. The membrane we used also did well. Uh, you can see that. Ah. The membrane we used also did uh, perfectly well. You can see um, it stayed in there, didn't leak or anything. Um, the epoxy that I used to put it in there, uh, kind of surprisingly, although I guess it's not really that surprising if I had a thought about it, a little bit before I made this with epoxy. Uh, the epoxy did not hold up to the chlorine uh, very well. You can see in there it's kind of gone all yellow, uh, whereas the other side, which was only exposed to sodium hydroxide, is perfectly clear. And then the final thing, uh, this is the total amount of sodium hydroxide solution that we managed to generate in our five runs of the cell. Um, so there's only 350 milliliters in there or so, but uh, that's because a lot of it has evaporated in the past uh, couple of weeks. But maybe later on I will boil that down and see if I can recover uh, the six or so grams of sodium hydroxide that we ended up generating in total. Um, this is just our anode sludge mixed together all five runs. Um, it's filled with a whole bunch of carbon particles uh, from the anode there. Uh, but over the next day or so those will all settle out and um, there's nothing particularly dangerous in there. But now all we really want to know at this stage is uh, the results, which uh, I'll go and put them into Excel right away and graph everything. Okay, results time. Uh, we're inside, out of the rain, so hopefully uh, the audio quality is a little bit better. Um, I've printed out all of the graphs that we have, but um, it's not going to be too nice if I try to film stuff and talk about it, so I'll probably just put the graphs on the screen as I refer to them. But let's get into it, I guess. Oh yeah, and just before we start, if you don't really care about results analysis, uh, you can skip to whatever the timestamp is on the screen right now. Using that, you can just skip to the conclusions that we will draw from all of the results. In particular, uh, the conclusions about how to best build a chloralkali cell. So starting off with our first graph, what we've got here for the first control run, we're basically just plotting the concentration of sodium hydroxide versus the charge that we've put through the cell. 
uh, that's measured in Faradays, which is basically a fancy term for uh, moles of electrons. And we see from the actual graph what we'd expect um, as we put more charge through the cell, then the concentration of sodium hydroxide rises. Now, if you remember in this run, uh, what we did was we had initially a one molar solution of sodium ions in the form of sodium chloride uh, in the anode chamber. Now we would expect uh, if the cell were absolutely 100% current efficient, so every mole of electrons we put through would transfer a mole of uh, sodium ions from the anode compartment to the cathode compartment, how uh, we would expect we would get all of our sodium ions across or the diaphragm after 0.1 Faradays of charge had flowed through the cell. Now obviously that's not what happened um, because instead of being uh, one molar solution of sodium hydroxide after 0.1 Faradays had flowed through the cell, we only have about uh, 0.25 molar. So really the whole process was about 25% efficient, which is about what is to be expected from uh, an amateur cell like this, especially with a pretty terrible uh, diaphragm or piece of clay pot. And then there's one last thing that we can see from a graph like this. Uh, you can see I've put a trend line on. What we can see from this is the fact that the rate of uh, sodium hydroxide generation in relation to charge actually tapers off as we run the cell more and more. Uh, the reason for this is of course the fact that as we're generating more uh, sodium hydroxide, uh, we've got two effects. Uh, one is the fact that the concentration of sodium chloride in the anode chamber is decreasing. So there are fewer uh, sodium ions to bring across through the diaphragm. And then the other effect being the fact that as we're generating more sodium hydroxide, uh, the concentration of hydroxide in the cathode compartment uh, also happens to be attracted to the anode. So that will start to pass through uh, the diaphragm as well, um, limiting the amount of effective current that is actually generating our sodium hydroxide. Now that we've seen what's going on with our control run, where we've done uh, one molar sodium chloride in the anode chamber, uh, we can compare this to um, the runs we did with sodium carbonate and sodium bicarbonate. So these are the results for the carbonate run. Once again, the actual sodium ion concentration in the anode chamber was initially set to be one molar, not the concentration of sodium carbonate, because of course they're actually different seeing as there are two sodium ions for every sodium carbonate formula. Uh, we have the bicarbonate run. Again, one molar sodium bicarbonate in the anode chamber initially. Now what came as a surprise to me, oh, I guess it wasn't that surprising, it was pretty reasonable, but what we see is the fact that pretty much all three of our sodium salts performed in pretty much the exact same way. So for any given amount of charge we put through the cell, uh, they generated pretty much exactly the same amount of sodium hydroxide, certainly uh, within the error of my measurements. You can see in this graph where I've plotted all three of those runs together that they really do follow pretty much the exact same trend line. The rate of sodium hydroxide production uh, is really independent to which sodium salt you choose to make it from. So really there's not much to talk about with uh, the second and third runs where we did the carbonate and bicarbonate. Uh, they're pretty much exactly the same as our control run. So we move on to the fourth run of the cell, uh, which is the one where we increased the concentration of sodium chloride in the initial anode chamber. Uh, doing this did bring some changes to the results. If we plot the control run and the two molar run um, on the same graph, you can clearly see that the efficiency of the two molar run was slightly better than the control run, which is to be expected. Once again, it still follows the same kind of tapering off trajectory uh, so the rate of sodium hydroxide production is still slowing down as we put more charge through the cell. Uh, that's to be expected because, well, it still follows the same rules as our control run, uh, just at a slightly higher efficiency due to our increased uh, concentration of sodium chloride initially. That brings us to our final uh, run of the cell where we increased the amount of current we were putting through. So the rate of the reaction uh, should have been sped up in this run, uh, I messed a few things up. This was where the where the carbon anode uh, disintegrated. It kind of stopped the cell uh, a bit short of when we were meant to. Pretty sure the last data point that we have on this graph is 
pretty highly inaccurate. Um, I'm pretty sure it should be quite a bit lower than it is shown. But anyway, while pretty unreliable, uh, the first three points on this graph um, do line up almost perfectly with the um, sodium hydroxide concentration graph of our control run. Uh, we still can kind of draw the conclusion that uh, the amount of current or the rate of charge transfer is independent of the current efficiency. And there we go. Uh, that's that for data analysis uh, onto some conclusions about the best way to build a chloralkali cell. I will present uh, these conclusions that we've drawn as four handy tips for maximizing current efficiency in a chloralkali cell. Now, number one, uh, the most important thing is to keep the concentration of the sodium ion in the anode chamber as high as possible. So what you should always be doing uh, is making sure that the anode chamber should be saturated with your sodium salt at all times. You should just fill it up with uh, sodium chloride or whatever sodium salt you're using and leave extra solid in there uh, for it to slowly dissolve as the salt gets depleted over time. Keeping that sodium ion concentration as high as possible will allow you to stay as close as possible to the maximum current efficiency uh, that your cell can handle. The maximum current efficiency of your cell uh, is basically going to be determined by the surface area and the material of your diaphragm that you're building the cell with. On to point number two, uh, current efficiency is technically unaffected by the type of sodium salt you use in your anode chamber. Uh, there are a couple of subtle points with this one, however, um, as per point number one, what we have to remember is that different sodium salts have different solubilities in water. Out of the three that we tried in this video, uh, sodium chloride is by far the most soluble, and so that will allow us uh, the greatest current efficiency at saturation. Um, carbonate is less soluble, and bicarbonate is less soluble again. So if you're following tip number one, then really the type of sodium salt you use does kind of affect uh, the current efficiency. Basically it's best to use sodium chloride because you can put more of it in solution for the reaction. And of course there are other factors that come into the type of sodium salt that you're going to be using. Um, the biggest factor is the fact that if you use sodium chloride you're going to be generating chlorine gas off the anode which a lot of people might not be able to deal with especially if you're working inside you should never uh, generate any quantity of chlorine inside that'd be really bad of course then um, carbonate is the next best thing but that's often more expensive than bicarbonate and even unavailable in some areas so it does really depend on circumstances uh, as per which sodium salt you choose i definitely recommend um, sodium chloride if you can deal with the chlorine um, sodium carbonate if you can't deal with the chlorine and if you can't get hold of sodium carbonate then go with sodium bicarbonate and the next point number three uh, we have current efficiency is unaffected by current which sounds like a little bit of a weird sentence to me but uh, it is true basically uh, what we're saying here is the fact that you can run the cell at any speed you want and it won't affect the current efficiency it will affect the energy efficiency which we'll get to in a couple of points but as far as current efficiency goes, it doesn't matter. And on to the final point about current efficiency. It's best to keep the concentration of sodium hydroxide low in the cathode chamber if possible. Now this one's normally a bit tricky because normally the point of making a chloroalkali cell is, well, it's to make sodium hydroxide and often uh, you'll want to be making as concentrated a solution as possible. As we run the cell um, and put more charge through it, the concentration of hydroxide in the cathode chamber rises. Of course, it's rising with the concentration of the sodium hydroxide that we actually want to generate, um, and that decreases the efficiency of the cell uh, the more sodium hydroxide we generate. So there are two ways you can maintain a good efficiency in the cell despite this happening, is you can uh, continue removing um, solution and adding in just regular distilled water, so kind of like cycling through the cathode chamber. So what you'd basically be doing is removing uh, the sodium hydroxide as it's being generated and allowing the cell to maintain a high efficiency. Uh, or you could simply make the uh, volume of the cathode chamber very large, so that despite the fact that you're generating uh, sodium hydroxide at a constant rate, 
uh, the rate of concentration increase uh, in the cathode chamber isn't going up very high because you have that very large volume that is diluting the uh, sodium hydroxide. And there we go, those are the four points uh, about current efficiency that we can infer from the data that we obtained in this experiment. Not that these are particularly profound. I mean, I guess these are all pretty standard ideas uh, for electrochemical synthesis. However, this was really just a proof that um, using the cell that we have put together, we can obtain meaningful results from which we can draw reasonable conclusions, which we certainly have. Anyway, moving on to a couple of tips about energy efficiency. We didn't cover that in the experiment in this video, uh, but I think they're probably worth mentioning, seeing as we're already going over tips on uh, how to best build an amateur chloroalkali cell. Uh, number one is you want to keep the voltage as low as possible with the cell, which is again a trade-off because uh, the lower the voltage, then the lower the rate of production you're going to get. But seeing as um, energy is given by voltage times the amount of charge that you put through the cell, uh, the lower the voltage is for any given amount of charge, uh, the more efficient the cell is going to be. Of course, running the cell slowly and keeping the voltage low also protects your electrodes uh, as well, so it's a win-win. And on to the second point, you want to make the surface area of the diaphragm you use as large as possible. Really, this is just a way uh, to help you with tip number one, making a large surface area diaphragm lowers the resistance of the cell, which allows you to run uh, any given amount of current through the cell with a lower voltage, which of course helps the energy efficiency. I've used a full clay pot as the diaphragm for a lot of my electrochemical experiments, uh, and those have an excellent surface area when you use the whole thing rather than just a small piece in a PVC pipe. So either maybe go with that or figure something else out, I don't know. And then point number three, uh, make the surface area of your electrodes uh, large as possible. This will once again lower the resistance of your cell and that will increase the energy efficiency once again. On that note, we can make a couple of points about electrode choice. If you use sodium chloride as your starting material, you have three choices for electrodes. There is MMO or mixed metal oxide electrodes, which are particularly good at generating chlorine gas, which is what we're doing. Uh, you have platinum, which is just a standard inert electrode, and you have graphite, which will slowly be consumed as you saw um, in the cell we ran today. Honestly, it's a matter of cost and availability for the electrode you use as the anode in that case. The cathode, of course, is in a reducing environment and it really doesn't matter which kind of metal you choose for that. Uh, just stay away from aluminium and basically anything else is fine. The rules are the same if you're going with a sodium carbonate or sodium bicarbonate cell. Basically, the only difference is that you can't use um, most types of MMO anode. Well, that's all the information I have to give you at this stage. I hope it was educational, helpful, whatever. I need this information in particular because we are working towards uh, building a large-scale uh, chloroalkali cell, uh, this kind of size, where we have a nice large surface area, uh, diaphragm in the middle, we have our cathode chamber, our anode chamber, We'll make it as efficient as possible, MMO electrodes and everything, it's going to be very cool. Uh, I need this in particular to make potassium hydroxide, which is pretty much exactly the same process as making sodium hydroxide, for which we will need uh, for a future video about making nitrates. But maybe you might want to make sodium hydroxide for any reason. Uh, maybe your sodium hydroxide is expensive, maybe you can't get hold of it, or maybe, I don't know, maybe you've got solar panels and want to make your sodium hydroxide uh, carbon neutral rather than buy sodium hydroxide that's been generated uh, with regular fossil fuel electricity. Anyway, I'm kind of going off topic there, uh, but basically uh, next video in the series, we will be building a much larger chloroalkali cell for producing actual meaningful quantities of sodium hydroxide. But there we are, um, long video, but I hope you found it helpful in some way or educational, I don't know. See you later.